Good evening from Tel Aviv. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Samuel. Uh, my name is Amos Nadan, and it gives me a great pleasure to open the Dan David 2020 conference on interdisciplinary approaches to the study of peasants in the near past. This will not be an ordinary conference. We aren't accustomed to having a conference on this topic for three days on Zoom and with such a diversity of excellent participants. I am excited. About two and a half years ago, the School of History at Tel Aviv University supported Professor Yuval Gadot, head of the Department of Archaeology and Ancient Near Eastern Studies, uh, Near Eastern Cultures, and myself from the Department of Middle Eastern and African History, in setting what is um, a peasant history laboratory. It is a hub where the peasant past is researched together by scholars and students from different academic backgrounds. This year, we have the special honor. We were invited to host the Dan David Conference and I wish to express my deep appreciation to the David family for the significant support. Yuval, Yes, good evening. Uh, it is a great honor, indeed a great honor for the two of us to host this conference, and I'm very excited also. And no less than that, I'm very excited to introduce the rector of Tel Aviv University, Professor Mark Steif. Before being appointed as rector about three months ago, Professor Steif headed the School of Electric Engineering at Tel Aviv University. He is a communicationist a scientist specializing in fiber optics and optical communication systems. As you may have noticed, he is not well accustomed to a, a history of, of uh, peasants or even archaeology, but I'm sure that his heart is in the right place, and I'm very honored that you are here to, uh, to begin the conference. Professor Steif. Okay. I couldn't unmute until now, but now I can. Thank you, Yuval, and uh, thanks to you. Now I uh, start understanding something in archaeology also. So yeah. There is some progress. <laughs> yes. Hello, everyone. Uh, I want to apologize up front for not being able to stay with you uh, for as much as I would like after this opening ceremony, but it is both a pleasure and honor for me to be here for the fourth annual meeting supported by... Uh, by the David family and uh, connecting historical studies with contemporary subjects and dilemmas. The question of how to assess the role of uh, social layers that are unable to document themselves is interesting from the historic methodological viewpoint, but it is also a relevant question in our current lives. Uh, how much or how do we make sure that we notice the presence of such layers or groups in our current society? This is a, always a relevant question to ask. I am not a historian, nor do I come from the field of social studies. As you've all mentioned, I am a communication scientist, scientist coming from the areas of, of engineering. Uh, but the subject of this conference sounds interesting to me and, uh, and uh, certainly relevant and uh, it must be relevant if even somebody like myself can appreciate this. So once again, on behalf of Tel Aviv University, I wish to thank the conference organizers, and in particular, uh, Dan, Dan David and family for supporting this framework. And of course, thank you, the participants of the conference, and I'm sure that you will have a, a very enjoyable event. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Professor Steif. And, uh... Yes, you are always welcome. Uh, before presenting our next speaker, I wish to uh, take a one minute and acknowledge persons without whom we would not have been able to have this evening, this very complex Zoom uh, and live uh, uh, moment. Uh, Amos has already mentioned our deepest thanks uh, to the Dan David family uh, who stand behind, not just this evening, but also behind the labs and the interdisciplinary studies. We wish uh, to convey our thanks to uh, Ms. Eilat Shalev Artu, the head of administrator of the Sviyavet School of History, uh, who really pushed us and helped us in every uh, possible way. 
And of course, to Asaf Shiloach, who at least the speakers got to know, a student, a PhD student from Tel Aviv University, who turned in a kind of a vague idea that Asaf and I had in our mind into a real conference with participants and lectures and so on. So thank you very, very much to both of you. And thank you also to our next speaker, Professor Miri Shefer Mosenzon, the head of the Tzvi Yavid School of History. Before Professor Shefer Mosenzon was appointed as the head of the school, uh, she came to one of my lectures uh, and heard me speaking about uh, terracing and terraces and told me that I have to meet Amos because Amos is dealing with the same period as I do, but in a completely different uh, angle. And from there, we went on and on. So we, we, we owe this marriage to a uh, Professor Miri Shefer Massenzon, and uh, we are very happy uh, that she can also uh, participate here with us. So Miri, the floor is, is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you, Amos. Thank you, Yuval. And uh, thank you, Professor Steif, Director of Tel Aviv University, for launching this conference. I also want to thank our new Dean, Professor Helga Litsinamon, for joining us. It's our first opportunity to host you at a school function, and it's a pleasure. So thank you for coming. And again, big thank you to the conveners, uh, Amos and Yuval. The Dan David Conference is one of the highlights in the academic schedule of the school. This is our platform to present cutting edge historical research. It is also an opportunity for us to showcase key social issues that have both historical and moral value relevant to this time and age. Because of these two different aspects, I'm so glad we're dedicating this Dan David conference to the historical roles of peasants in agrarian societies. I'm reminded of James C. Scott's influential book, Seeing Like a State. He analyzes how well-intended projects initiated and imposed by the modern state eventually failed. They did more than fail. These projects brought calamities to the population. While peasantry is not necessarily a theme in his book, peasants <coughs> do figure a lot throughout the text. He explains how peasants had to endure destructive consequences of standardization in measurements, language, and so on. They suffered, and with them suffered the environment, the economy, the political system, society, that is all of us. The conference will allow us to think together in an interdisciplinary manner how we can resurrect the voices of those who did not speak for themselves. In this time and age, it is our obligation to speak out. So thank you again, Amos and Yuval, for convening this conference, and I wish all of us a very fruitful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Miri. Uh, now it's time to move to the main presentation of the evening. We will have a lecture by Professor Samuel Pupkin. I will follow, it will follow by discussion by uh, Professor Garrett Austin, and then we'll open the floor, or shall I share the virtual floor uh, at Zoom. To continue uh, uh, to facilitate this, I will now present both uh, speakers. Professor Garrett Austin. Professor Garrett Austin is a professor of economic history at the University of Cambridge. He was, in fact, the first person who recommended to me the book, The Rational Peasants, The Political Economy of Rural Society in Vietnam by Professor Samuel Pupkin. Professor Austin's uh, primary research focuses on Ghana and West Africa in the 19th and 20th century. And by definition, this includes much research on the peasantry. He also written extensively on comparative economic history with particular reference to Africa, Asia, and Latin America, and has several publications on global history. Personally, it is a great honor for me to have him with us, not only because of the opportunity to have a unique and very prominent economic historian at this conference. But because for me, Garrett is a friend, was also my PhD supervisor at the London School of Economics. 
And now, Professor Samuel Pupkin. Professor Pupkin is a professor emeritus of political science at the University of California, San Diego. He's well known for his work on peasant societies with particular reference to East and Southeast Asia. His book, The Rational Peasant, signified the end of a heated debate on the extent of peasant rationality, aspect of profit maximization, and protection of the crops against unforeseen eventuality. His finding on the peasantry for 1979 are still very relevant in present day analysis of, of policymaker and of historians. Professor Pup Pupkin has published in other areas as well. Perhaps the best known to the wider public are books on presidential campaigns in the United States. If you want to know what it takes to win and all the White House, read the book by Professor Pupkin. Without further introduction, here is the lecture on rationality and enforceable norms in peasant societies by Professor Pupkin. Professor Pupkin, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm going to um, immediately slightly reorganize my uh, talk uh, to deal with the very uh, justified praise of Jim Scott's work on seeing like a state because for most of the period of my book's existence, Jim and I have been locked in a debate like Russo and Hobbes, where the easy question to give graduate students on their um, written PhD exams in political science was Scott versus Popkin, discuss. And that's because I didn't explain what I was doing well enough. And so, one of the disappointments, one of the very few disappointments to me of a book that has done much better longer than I ever expected was that people very often decide which book is right by looking at the title. Do you like the peasants to be moral or do you want them to be rational? And so we had a simple-minded debate, a divide of how people like the books that was unjustified, I think, on either side because it minimized one of us to the other side without seeing the overlap. And I'm very proud of the fact that for all the 41 years of my book's existence, Jim and I have never been unfriendly to each other. And several of his books have praise of my reading of them. And I have always been grateful to him. Um, my whole career, whether I'm studying voters, presidential candidates, um, big money donors trying to buy people, has always been about it, trying to explain the way people make sense of the world around them. And even when I was doing computer work with Ithiel de Sola Pool on simulations, it was always trying to work out step by step the choices people made in their daily life. So. Everything we did was about agency. And I've always remembered in my writing a lesson from the late great game theorist, Martin Schubeck. When Mar Martin taught his graduate courses, the first assignment was that the economists had to read Good Soldier Schweik and Franz Kafka's The Trial and write a paper explaining how they were both written in exactly the same time period in the same country? How could the bumbling soldier stumbling around and not knowing what's going on and the bureaucratic maze of Kafka be the coexistence of, of the same people? Um, my story of writing the book is going to Vietnam to avoid the draft. In, 1960, in the 60s, I took time out of graduate school to work on the war and poverty and the romantic fixing the world of Lyndon Johnson and the Great Society. And I was going to get drafted. And instead of getting drafted and being a bureaucrat at the Pentagon, I thought the right thing to do was use my social science to make the world better 
And I ended up in Vietnam studying village warfare and, and, and guerrilla warfare and how peasants survived from day to day. The two sides, one side might kill you, the other side might bury you or bomb you. And when I was back from Vietnam teaching at, at Harvard, I was part of a Vietnam study group. And my fiance, now wife, Susan Chirk, was in Hong Kong for a year interviewing Chinese uh, refugees about life in China. And suddenly my good friend and neighbor, with whom I spent so much time, Dan Ellsberg, surprised the world by releasing the Pentagon Papers. And just because I was so close to Dan and young, there was an assumption by the Nixon White House and Henry Kissinger, who knew me, that I must have had a part in this. And I was dragged in front of grand juries to talk about all the sources of my research. And I had absolutely nothing to do with the release of the Pentagon Papers. I didn't know that there was such a particular source, but we all had secrets. And I knew millions and lots and lots of the military officers who were in town doing um, graduate theses. And all of a sudden, when the Pentagon Papers were released, I realized the people who came to me and said, I'm writing a term paper on X. What do you think I should read? <laughs> These were chapters of the Pentagon Papers. And I couldn't name the names to a grand jury without destroying these people's career. And so I was the first American professor jailed for not testifying in front of a grand jury after an 18 month court battle. And I couldn't continue my work on contemporary Vietnam for obvious reasons. I couldn't go back to Vietnam without uh, raising a lot of suspicions. So I started digging through the library and the human relations area file and reading the history of the villages. And what I learned reminds us how important it is to ignore conventional wisdom and assume conventional wisdom is an oxymoron like military intelligence, that somehow whatever people think is the trend of the day is missing something. And at the time I was looking at peasants, this was a hopeful moment between civil rights, women's liberation, and the near, the peer bulge all over the world of the, the movements of the 60s. And the, the writings that inspired everybody's work on peasants were the work of Eric Wolf, Eric Hobsbawm, R.H. Taney. And in retrospect, I realized these were what you might call hydraulic theories where the pressure builds up on the peasants and then it explodes out and there's a revolution. And I loved in, in my book, uh, the Woody Allen joke, in English, there, there are two words for the czar, the T-S-A-R and the C-Z-A-R. And Woody Allen once wrote a New York Times op-ed page when he said that the Russian Revolution occurred when the serfs realized that all the sins of the TSAR and all the wrongs of the CZAR were just one person doing it all and they could take it no longer. And when I started to read the actual history, I, in Vietnam at least, it seemed that these romantic stories um, about the, the poor, the special virtues of the poor and how they lived before the colonialism uh, penetrated the village, the very phallic image of this noble idyllic society raped and pillaged by the capitalists didn't really fit things. And when you're studying war, of course, what's on your mind every minute is this, the old story of the, the mice, the cat, and the bell, where the mice are very happy in the farmhouse coming out every night to eat the wonderful food the farmer's wife leaves on the table. But then the farmer gets a cat and the first few mice that go out for crumbs at night are eaten by the cat and so the mice have a meeting in, the, in their hole 
and saying, how are we going to deal with the cat? What are we going to do? We can't eat. And one of the mice says, I propose we put a bell around the cat's neck. And everybody agrees that's the perfect solutions so they'll know when the cat's awake. But of course, the problem is, so who's going to go out there and try to put the bell on the cat without being eaten by the cat? You know, the, the, the ultimate conflict between what's good for the individual and what's good for the group. And there are versions of that I've realized all over the world. And I kept finding anomalies in Vietnam that didn't fit the story. And so I thought, well, Vietnam is an exception to the way the story of the world from Jim Scott's first book or from Tawny or Hobbsbaum or Wolf. But as I kept looking, I realized all the stories weren't asking the questions that the whole issue of the free rider arise, uh, brings up. The story of, well, who's going to put the bill around the cat? How do we reconcile the individual interests of me and my share of the collective interests of the group? And I wrote this book to challenge all the romantic theories and show how much deeper we could get. And I'm really happy to be able to give this talk and, and, and clear my mind. I've just, I'm just in the middle of reading the copy edited manuscript for Oxford Press for a book on the crack up of the American system and the rise of people like Donald Trump to political power. And it's such a, so nice to talk about war and peace in the past and said, and the joys of how much I was able to learn from history about peasants. The, the, the heart of all the romantic theories was, was that the transition of villages from the old closed form of the village to the open form of more interactions with the outside always destroyed peasant welfare. And as Hobsbawm put it, revolutionism followed naturally from the opening. And there was a consistent theory that made these pieces fit together, tying the theory of the peasant to the role of the, the functioning of the village, to the relations of the village, to the society. And they didn't really fit in the end. And the basis of a lot of it was not that peasants were irrational then, but that the calculus governing their behavior gave us more moral outcomes than we got later. And by the, the closed villages that were so much of the world in these days, they were the villages where there was a limit on the ability of outsiders to buy land, there was collective responsibility by the village to pay taxes, to um, send men for the draft, or to build the dikes, to do public works, that everything was a village quota sent out. And that the basis of why the village worked so well is there was a subsistence norm that guaranteed everybody a minimum subsistence. And the theory fits together if and only if there was this subsistence norm that everybody lived by, that there was a minimum for everybody. And what I want to lead up to, and I hope this the timing is right so I get to the end, is that there's a that there's a um connection with, let me back up a second. I got ahead of myself because I wanted to tell my favorite story too soon. Um, that this all fits together if there are no free riders in the village. If nobody skimps on the collective for the good of themselves, if nobody hides their profits, if nobody values what's good for them over what's good for the, the community, then it all works. But this only connects if there was no interest in individual gain and everybody was willing to share everything needed to maintain a floor so that they were 
equalizing life chances, Eric Wolf's phrase, and always following a safety first principle for everybody that, that fit with village procedures. And there were always open questions in this that I couldn't understand as a political scientist. Like, well, if the village lives by norms, who decides the norms? Who decides what the minimum subsistence level is? Or when I started reading history, I, when I couldn't work on Vietnam and I'm reading in the library, I started to see things like, why did peasants ask for more after the plagues if the lords were giving them everything they needed and they didn't want anymore? Um, how did people rank the needs of a person without children versus a person with three hungry children or old people and young people? There were all these questions of how was work shared when the involution of Clifford Geertz was occurring? And then the one that really hit me, uh, the, the great very valuable work of Deidre McCloskey, who gave me some of the most powerful encouragement and help when I was finally finishing the book. Why do peasants have scattered plots within the village? Scattered plots are a very rational way of guaranteeing your floor when there can be flooding or drought, a wild animal rampaging part of the village, but not another but it's an individual strategy that goes against maximizing the output for the village. If you wanted to maximize total output, you'd share the output of the village in an efficient system and you wouldn't spend so much time wandering from field to field and there wouldn't be so much wasted land with the dikes between the rice fields. And as I'll comment later, I realized a lot of what I wrote was about the special nature of the rice economy. And in particular, something I kept finding in, in the books, discussion in the villages of insiders and outsiders. And I realized whatever you want to say about the full members of the village and how good they were to each other, the theories of the goodness of the village only applied to a fraction of all the people alive at any time historically, because the outsiders, a little bit like the kind of unspoken system in the US with the undocumented laborers who are essential to the farm economy, but aren't quite given the same help and care and medical treatment as everybody else. And as long as they're quiet, Everybody is happy to pretend they don't exist. And that was the situation in villages with membership and also people living there who were second class citizens, a, a kind of secret apartheid almost. And the communal land distribution system, I realized, was in charge of the elders and there was no priority for needy in the way things were done. And that sometimes in Indonesia or elsewhere, when colonial governments wanted progressive taxes, they were resisted by the village elites. And one of the, the, the moments that reassured me was I happened by chance one time to have a dinner where I was seated at the table with Peter Drucker and his wife. And I found out they were lifelong, very close friends of Carl Polanyi. And they were together at Bennington, I believe it was, when Carl was writing The Great Transformation. And every day, Carl would come running over to the, the Druckers and say, I finally found a society where it fits, where they don't want markets, where they do it all without markets. And he, he was sure they were there and he just hadn't found it yet. And he made me realize, okay, the search for this nirvana, give it, you don't have to worry because I've been looking and looking, assuming most of the time the moral economists were right and Vietnam was the exception. And I even found a friend who knew medieval Latin to read the old gleaning rules because having read the, 
you know, the Torah when I was a kid. I thought the poor and the widows and the orphans had the right to get the corners of the field after the harvest. And I found out that that wasn't true in the Middle Ages in Europe. The only time the poor got any rights to the gleaning were after the workers had picked it over as much as they could and the priest got them in there before the cattle finished it off. That it was the church who started to protect the poor as a way of developing a, a congregation, not the, the lords or the, or the landowners or the better off. And I even found a wonderful old village constitution in, in one of the French uh, anthropology books from the late 18th and early 90th, 19th centuries or 20th century where the village constitution said, we don't need rules right now because everybody here in our village is good and moral and virtuous but we specify the rules just in case in the future, somebody isn't as moral and virtuous and decent as we all are now. And I realized that villages, the, the, the leveling egalitarian village of the happy myths of the 60s and the uh, cultural liberation never existed but that the villages really mattered to the welfare of everybody, that you would find people living in villages as outsiders, even when there was free land available on the frontier, that the villagers were a place where there were norms you could live with, that you could live by and work by, and that you had an institutional framework. It wasn't egalitarian, but it was a viable framework within which you could work like a, a stock exchange or a bazaar or the medieval, the medieval law judges that made it possible to have long distance trade and which by the way, inspired Pierre Omidar, the work of Avner Grief when he developed eBay and you had the system of developing reputations for the, the people online. And this, made me realize the importance of norms and sharing. And one of the things I realized was that almost all of the sharing in villages was about insurance, not welfare. And it's never left me in my political work and elections either, the difference between insurance and welfare. When we all buy car insurance, we expect that some years we'll get nothing, but the year we need a lot, we'll get it back, that we're putting in every year a little so that when we need a lot back for the new car or the damage we did or the pain we're suffering, we get what we want. And it's an expectation that it evens out over our lifetime, our costs. And almost all the sharing within Village It was insurance. And it was seldom, if ever, village-wide sharing. It was small group sharing. And sort of, to me, the, the quintessential sharing was the funeral group or the planting group. And a funeral group would be, okay, we all have parents. A parent dies. We have to have called the shiva, the wake, the burial, the big banquet the gathering of people, and it's expensive and it can break you. So a group agrees when one of the parents dies, everybody provides a chicken, a lamb, something depending on the culture. And it's over time, everybody gets their share. And the same with when you plant together, you plant all the rice together in my field and then we flood it, then we plant together in yours. And notice one thing that people never shared were plow animals where you take the animal and plow your field then you give it to me and I plow mine. Because when a plow animal is damaged, the damage doesn't show up right away and nobody could tell. 
who overworked the animal and it strained its leg and now it's crippled when it comes to my field. It's always small things that violate the notion of everybody is a free rider. The pure economics of collective good is that nobody ever contributes to things like clean air or global warming and that you only get any collective action when there's immediate benefits to you. Like somebody with a gun says, either you do your share or I kill you, or you do your share or I fine you, that you don't do anything voluntarily. But there's some assumptions there that can be violated by clever designs. And I wanna, I hope I have time and I get to Eleanor Ostrom and all her clever work the other economics Nobel laureate on the ways people de devised really clever ways to predict uh, forest land for the others or uh, special mountain pastures. And the assumptions of the pure free rider theory in economics are that your in your contribution has nothing to do with how much other people contribute because they don't see your contribution. And your contribution has no impact on the level of what you get out of the other's contribution. That means there's no excludability. And in the small groups, you don't bring your chicken, you're done. You don't come and plant you're done. In some parts of the world, if you can't plow your field, you're expelled from the village. If you have a bad back and you're, you're crippled, either you get a relative to come or you're out. In Mexico, I, I know a graduate student, now a professor, I, knew, I met a graduate student we tried to hire now at Berkeley who had to leave graduate school and go to Mexico and plow his brother's land when his brother broke his back. Otherwise the brother would be thrown out of his Puebla for not being able to do his share. And when you have small groups, the collective good of giving everybody the funeral they need can be provided. And it's all about finding ways and in, in the language of a Thomas Schelling for the sharing to be visible to everybody and affect your ability to be part of the iteration. And there's all these groups everywhere, hunting, planting, um, funerals, and then peasants find ways to form teams when it, when it helps. From the Volga boatmen to planting teams that people might hire to do their field, the team knows about the shirking and people having a good day and a bad day and they work together. So you hire the team and you don't have to know about the quality of the individuals. You just have to know the reputation of, of the leader. And I realized that peasants are always taking advantage and, and adapting to the opportunities. And I wanna tell my favorite story now. This story, it took me years to verify it. One year on the way, well, I won't tell the story of how I learned the story. It's too good. It's a great story, but it's very long and I don't know how my timing is going. Um, but I trust me, I can verify every single bit of the story, the part that's in a book and the part that I had to get in, in person from a person who was involved with the story. Early in the 20th century, during the Re Mexican revolutions, besides the famous re re revolt by uh, Pan uh, Viva Z by Zapata, there was a second revolt in part of Mexico led by Pancho Villa against the oppressive Mexican government. And when Pancho Villa started out, he was charismatic and had extraordinary voluntary support from the peasants. And he would, and there were areas with giant um, cotton plantations and silver mines, and he would ride in with his men and the peasants living there and working there would happily and voluntarily 
give bags of corn and bags of wheat to his men who would ride off with the food they needed to carry on their fight. But over a few years, it descended into a kind of banditry with taxes. As it became clear, Pancho Villa could never succeed in controlling territory. And his men were carrying on because they didn't know what else to do. The only thing they knew how to do was be, be fighters or bandits. And the peasants were more and more unhappy about the need to either feed these men or be shot, killed, or at least beaten and whipped for not having food for them. And the peasant adaptation was they grew only watermelons and squash. And the answer, the person I met with the story said is, and the answer is, you can always just grow watermelons and squash. And why are watermelons and squash the answer to rapacious bandits? The answer is, how many watermelons or pumpkins can you carry on one horse? They couldn't take all the food anymore. The peasants are living on nothing but watermelons and squash, but they don't lose the same share of their food. And eventually the bandits stopped coming. And I like the story because it, it fits with a lot of the stories Selwyn Su Su Bialer used to tell about the kulaks in Ukraine and, and Stalin, where there, there's an assumption often, and it's somehow burned into Bolshevik uh, manuals of how to, how to collectivize or how to take over in countries. The peasants have a f fixed work they do every year, like the old racist notion of the backward bending and if they're not giving you their grain, they're burying it in their basement or they're hiding it for you to get. And the, the story of the kulaks and the, and the hidden grain, when simply if they know Stalin's taken all their grain, they don't borrow money and plant as much. And that's a story all over the world of when there's a war going on, you're careful about how much you plant because it's going to get taken if you do too, too much. And but it gets repeated because there's these assumptions built in. In Vietnam, for example, when the North and South were unified and the communist government and the very market-oriented Southern region of the country started to collectivize, all the peasants knew that there was going to be collective plowing, meaning all the water buffalo at the end of the year were going to be collected and managed as a whole by the commune. And the peasants, though, were allowed to sell that year's rice crop. And so they would hitch the cart to their buffalo, take the cart into the city, sell all their rice. They had developed collapsible foldable carts they would collapse the cart, take the buffalo, the water buffalo to the butcher, sell the buffalo, take a trilambretta back to the village and do it all over again. So the buffalo were all eaten before the communists realized what was going on. And there's a part of the misunderstanding that goes on over and over of how peasants take advantage of new opportunities. And the Today, there's a huge amount of work being done in villages, experimental economics, that's wonderful, um, particularly the work of um, du Duflo and Banerjee. Um, and it, it, it warms my heart to see it, but all of their work is about the easy part, I shouldn't say easy, but about supply and demand. And they've been deserved every honor that, uh, Esther and Abhijit have gotten for the way they've shown strategies and families. I mean, who would have thought without their research that the way to cut AIDS among young women in Africa was to make sure they had free school uniforms? Because if they had a uniform, they could go to school 
and then they wouldn't be around the house with the choice of either being a rich man's mistress or spending their life doing what their father and brothers wanted. So you would give them a free uniform and they'd stay in school and not have to take on a rich man who had AIDS as, a, as, as their lover to keep them out of trouble. And just all these examples, or when a call center opens, suddenly the fathers are willing to let their daughters get educated. And it, but it ignores some of the powerful examples of where you have to develop norms and how norms get developed. And my favorite example is a colleague of mine who's justly been honored through uh, international awards for the work he did, of all things, a game theory paper at the University of Chicago on how they ended foot binding in China that later became the model for ways to end female genital mutilation in Africa. There was the old, the initial approach to ending foot binding by the missionaries in China was educate the parents to understand foot binding is really not very healthy and your daughters will be better off if you don't find their feet. It was a total failure. There's, in fact, there's an old Chinese saying, a mother can't love her daughter and her daughter's feet. She has to choose. Because if you didn't bind the daughter's feet in large parts of China, the daughter couldn't get married because that meant the daughter was not eligible for upward mobility because nobody could enter the, the emperor's harem without bound feet. And nobody wanted to say, well, we mar our son has a daughter so inferior, no emperor would ever want her. She comes from a family that can't abort, afford to take away her labor by binding her feet. So the marriage status food chain kept it going. And the missionaries or the, actually I maybe it was, I don't know if it was Sun Yat Sen or the missionary, they realized the only way you can end foot binding is to have a new marriage market. It took mass meetings of tens of thousands of people who would sign a pledge. You agree not to have your son ever marry somebody with a bind feet. We promise never to bind our daughter's feet. And th this was a success. And it was part of the, and the same thing eventually, and, and I don't know what percent of, of Africa today because my colleague, Jerry Mackey, is off somewhere doing work for UNESCO, which adopted <clears throat> a modification of this paradigm that a woman's group working in Africa developed. And some, I'm sure Professor Austin or some of the other people there know much more about how it ended, but the developing of new markets where people first did individual work as NGOs explaining to people the health benefits and convincing some religious leaders, really, it's a better life. You ch The thing that people said could never be changed, and Mackey was attacked for saying, you're ruining the culture. You're destroying the core of the culture if you have people not bind the feet. But in fact, it started imposed by um, earlier Muslim colonialism of the areas and the ending of foot binding was no more destruction of the culture than the entrance of tomatoes or potatoes into Europe from Columbus's voyages. And it's made a very big difference in how well things function. And the work of Eleanor Ostrom has been very good beyond the small group, large norms can develop for villages of how much of the wood you cut in, in, in a forest. If you find very, very simple ways to limit how much wood each family can take on their own. And this has been developed, for example, by having only one path that people are allowed to take to the forest. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mm. 
in <clears throat> Japan, for example, there's only one open path from some villages to the forest. And there's only one specific bag you're allowed to use for your firewood. And the village decides based on the weather of the year, how often each person can go with their bag. And so for a large village, now all you need is one old man sitting by the path and keeping track of who goes. And so you have a norm that can be followed with very low monitoring. And sometimes even the primitives who have no idea quotes of the idea of private property develop private property to protect the resource. There's famous stories in economics of the native tribes of Northern Canada suddenly developing private property rights to forests so that nobody would, sh nobody would take more beaver pelts to sell to the traders when the French king was putting on beaver hats so nobody would kill the pregnant beaver because they knew the beaver would be there for them the next year. And something similar was done with lobster fishermen in Maine. A rule, a, a paradigm was developed for the protection of the crop from year to year. And I might say, although it shows how strict I am about my religion, lobster has never been less expensive than in the last decade or so in the US because there's a, a norm, well, there's a rule that you can't capture and keep any lobster bigger than a certain size on the grounds that the big ones are the ones that do the breeding. And the problem is if you catch a big one and you throw it back in the water, how do you know somebody else isn't gonna say, thanks sucker, schmuck, why did you throw the lobster back in? I'm gonna take this big lobster and get a fortune for it on the black market. And the answer was they developed the simple code. You cut a notch in the tail of the lobster, you throw it back in the water and, you, and there's a law. Any merchant caught with a lobster that has a notched tail pays a large fine. So now if you're gonna catch a big lobster, the most thing you can do is sneak it home and eat it with your family or find a secret cellar somewhere. So you've limited the, the use of it. And these are examples of how you can develop norms that work in these, these different situations. And there are a lot of them. And, and, and it's all about the, 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 the bottom simple rationality, the, the looking for reasons of how these people work things out. And it's given me such a rich life now when I talk with people like our good friend, Malcolm Wiener, who do archeology, span or when I visit sites and drive the uh, tour guides crazy with my questions about figuring out the pieces of how it worked or how many goats does it take to marry your daughter today in, 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 in Namibia or something, but it, it works very well. And I was encouraged when the Leakeys discovered the first um, very, very old uh, remains in Africa. I believe that the one they called Lucy, um, and if I'm the wrong name, I apologize. They, there was a cliff with herds of animals at the bottom of the cliff that were driven over the edge by hunters and then were at the bottom, the, the carcasses. And they thought to themselves, if I were a rational hunter, where would I hang out after I, when I came down to eat these animals? They said, well, I'd want to be near water and I'd want to be safe from raids. So where is there a little hill near water we should start digging? And that's how they figured out the reason, they, you know, assuming simple reasoning where they looked and found the, the first skeletons. So I could go on for a long time talking about the work of um, Eleanor Ostrom, but I think I'm very, very close to somehow by luck, I'm very close to where I ended. And it, this is a career I never expected to be doing this, but it, the joy of finding all these things 
and making sense out of the mirror and these villages was great fun. And I never thought of it as being an attack on culture. The way somebody said to me once, well, if all the villages have the same rules, what's culture all about? And I, I, I didn't understand that because it seemed to me, I know that it's the head of the village who gets the tail of the pig or the ears of the pig served first. But I can't explain why that's so important. I can't explain a lot of the pieces. I just see the patterns. And I get asked now in conclusion, why did you call it the rational peasant and the reasoning voter as opposed to vice versa? And the answer is everything I wrote about patterns was about repetitive interactions that you see the results on a daily basis and you learn over time with through iteration. When you're talking about voting, you're betting on dreams and promises that are very hard to verify. So there's a lot more room for fantasy and ideals and naivete than there is when your survival depends on figuring out how to do it. And thank you for giving me a chance to revisit this. It's, it hasn't been easy to remember it all, but it's it's been very pleasurable to think that we're still applying the ideas of today to understanding what we want to understand better about the, the, the recent past. My kids used to tell me, remember, Nobody wants to hear old people talk about stories of what they did when they were young, but this is one opportunity where you're actually invited to do it. So thank you very much. Samuel, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. And uh, now we'll move to Professor Garrett Austin. Garrett? Thank you very much, Amos, and thank you to the organizers uh, as a whole and funders and uh, to you particularly Amos for giving me the opportunity to hear uh, Professor Popkin whose work I've admired uh, for a very long time as you alluded to Amos. Um, this does create a problem in the sense that I think the most satisfactory commentators are ones that disagree profoundly with what has been said. And in this case, the opposite is the case. Um, I think the only thing I slightly queried was the um, a, a very minor point, which was about the, uh, the proposition that plow animals are not shared. Um, simply in that, I think I'm right in saying, though this is not in the area where I study, I think Philip Schofield would know this better, um, that you, there are cases historically of societies in which plough animals were hired out. Yes. And the same logic would apply that if you don't have an insurance policy, the chances are you'd underprice this. Um, but I, I'm sure that it would work, it would be true as far as sharing is concerned. So, what I thought I would do, apart from um, making a, a note to remember such phrases as um, I went to Vietnam to avoid the draft. Um, it's true. <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's to comment on a couple of things which arise from some of the things you, you said. One of them is about why people revolt and in this case why peasants revolt and this applies both to, for the, along the whole scale from protests. Um, I'm not so much talking about uh, surreptitious resistance uh, as in the um, Mexican uh, story, um, but where do people make protests and where do they actually risk their lives in uh, a major revolt? Here I think um, it's useful to recall that the term moral economy has more than one meaning. I mean, in fact, these days it's become um, such a cliche that it's used very loosely. But it seemed to me, and I may well be wrong about this, but um, when I read um, both your book and uh, E.P. Thompson's The Moral Economy of the, of the English Crowd, um, from the early 1970s, which I think may have been the first use of the term. 
before Jim Scott. Um, oh, yeah. He used it in a, I think, in a narrower sense than Scott, in that Thompson made it clear, uh, particularly in a, a later essay, that he didn't mean to offer a kind of Polanyi view in which human nature is at stake and where and Polanyi didn't want to accept that humans could be could be greedy I think is basically the, the underlying idea um, and so what Thompson described was certainly as she has with um, Scott rational behavior though neither of them would put it that way um, but what I Tom, Tom Thompson's starting point was a critique of was to criticize the idea that uh, in the case he was talking about, English crowds in the 18th century protested simply because they were hungry, simply because the price of bread had gone up. Um, he argued that they protested because they felt a sense of, sense of outrage that a moral convention had been broken. And I think that is very often the case. And it is important, I think, in perhaps in every generation of social science to <laughs> to, to rediscover this. I mean, I'm thinking of some papers that I, I, I won't name on Africa, which um, find a correlation between something and protests and simply assume that it's for because the objective circumstances have changed, you don't need to look for anything else to explain why people are protesting. And at that point, I, I remember the point that Thompson made that people have beliefs in their heads which mediate their responses to incentives. Um, but this of course is actually very consistent with the argument of the, the, the rational peasant. I think one other thing I would add which um, does chime with what you were saying um, about um, Hobsbawm and Wolf and so on, and the your rather nice um, metaphor for their approach of it being a hydraulic interpretation of of, rev of revolts, that the pressure builds up until suddenly, until some day it inevitably bursts. It is extremely important to avoid teleolo teleological views. Um, it is much more useful to think about how circumstances change in ways that increase the likelihood that. Um, the uh, peasants will realize that the CZARs are also the TZARSs. Um, but there's, there is no, there's nothing automatic about it. The other thing that I wanted to mention, um, actually, uh, the, the turn out to be three rather than two things. So one was a comment about why people protest. The second is something that follows from the I think the, the rather more limited notion of moral economy that Scott, that Thompson proposed, which is, um, yes, it's a very striking feature that all the early uses of the term were in the context of spreading market relations. And the people who um, were considered to espouse a moral economy were supposed to be reacting against that. Um, in my own research, I think I can offer an example of a moral economy of the market or a pro-market moral economy. And I think there are plenty of others. And the example I have in mind is concerns witchcraft accusations or is revealed by the direction of witchcraft accusations. In this case, in colonial Southern Ghana. It's a cliche um, in that in Africa, witchcraft accusations are supposed to be directed um, upwards against the nouveau riche who must have cheated in order to become rich. And that's well documented that you do find that pattern of behavior in 19th century uh, Congo, as we would now say, and 1990 South Africa and many other places, but it isn't universal. And in colonial Southern Ghana, in the area where people had adopted export agriculture, specifically cocoa, and lots of people were prospering considerably and improving their standards of living. Their uh, contemporary studies, which were not interested in this particular question, but saw it from other angles, but provide very helpful evidence, 
the direction of accusations was downwards. It was the prosperous cocoa farmer accusing the envious poor of wanting to do him or his wife down by causing the crops to spoil or the wife to be barren. And this, uh, it seemed to me, reflected um, a, I and mean, you can bring in various concepts in the, the, the local language, a very um, positive view of self-made wealth and a contempt for people who made no efforts to acquire wealth. And this is not a society in which um, begging was considered to be a, a respectable activity. I mean, there are plenty of African societies in which it was, but this is one where that, that wasn't the case. So I would see that as a moral economy of the market, or at least that was pro-accumulation, um, rather than the, uh, the opposite, as we see in, in Thompson, or indeed in Scott's vision. Um, my final thought is about the refutation of interpretations, theories that turn out to be empirically wanting, um, which uh, clearly was something that um, you devoted a, a lot of effort to in, in writing The Rational Peasant. Um, there's an interesting paper, which I'm sure some people present will have read, published in the Journal of Development Studies in 2012 by Alistair Orr, O -R -R, uh, which was called, why, did so, why Were So Many Social Scientists Wrong About the Green Revolution? Lessons from Bangladesh. And this was a case where according to him, all the prophecies that the uh, poorer peasants would have to sell up, that you'd see polarization, essentially the end of peasant society. This turned out to be wrong and he asked why. And part of the answer was essentially a sampling problem that the early pessimistic studies tended to be single village studies. And un unfortunately they turned out not to be very representative. But as a historian, I was particularly interested in another reason that all gives, which is essentially the use of the wrong historical paradigm that so many of people who wrote it um, were convinced that Karl Marx must have got it right in his account of the emergence of capitalism in England and that this was a transportable model and clearly the Green Revolution brought to South Asia the, what enclosures according to Marx brought to, to uh, England and indeed to Scotland um, and that I think is a very telling example and one which reminds us not that historical precedents are not useful but that we have to be critical when we consider applying them. Um, and my final, um, very final thought comes from a quotation that Orr has at the beginning of his article. It's a quotation from Nietzsche who I'm not at all inclined to quote but on this occasion um, Nietzsche said uh, something to the effect of the most, um, th th uh, said that, yeah, conviction is more dangerous to truth than lies. Now, I think if we think about politics in the US or indeed in Britain in the last few, few years, there would be reason to doubt that he was right, or at least certainly reason for thinking he exaggerated. But it is certainly true that I think conviction often is. Um, a problem when it comes to identifying truth and the reaction to the the two phrases moral economy and moral and rational peasant um, certainly exemplify that so thank you for giving me the opportunity to um, hear um, Professor Popkin and um, to make a few comments on the margins if not a not, if hardly a corrosticating critique um, <clears throat> thank you very yeah. much, Guy. Thank you, Mr. Uh, thank you. Do I get it? I would like to yes, add. Yes, indeed, a... indeed. Okay. Well, first of all, <clears throat> I am <clears throat> very relieved that Professor Austin has read my book because 
I felt terrible when they said he'd like to see your paper in advance. And I said, all I have is an outline. Um, I'm, I'm delighted and I'm really happy that he, had, that he talked about E.P. Thompson because E.P. Thompson fits very well the fantasies about the Twitter revolutions as well as his examples about the bread riots or whatever. I had a list at one time. Every time any country in North Africa, Latin America, or Europe raised the price of the baguette, the bread, the rolls, the pita, whatever was the local bread that was regulated by the government, there were massive protests. And this is an example of, number one, there's a clear focal point that hits everybody at once. It's not like we're whipping one family here and one family there once in a while, or we're dispossessing somebody once in a while all over in random areas. It's everybody getting it at once. And the demand is as simple as the bumper sticker kinds of demands of any mob from end the war tomorrow, Mubarak must go, open the schools, or the moral economy demand all over America today, let us reopen the bars, we're not the problem, or the restaurant owners. Suddenly, the restaurant owners and the bar owners in California and elsewhere are demanding the moral right to sell you liquor no matter what the pandemic would, would say we would be better doing. And the point is you can get the disorganized mob with very, very little um, organization and communication if somebody announces the march is Friday morning or we're gonna meet in the square or, you know, Somebody must go. It's a simple demand and it all falls apart later because, okay, so Mubarak's gone. Now what? Um, what are the rules going to be? How are we going to get elected? And the, the small group with 18% of the vote ends up controlling the parliament because nobody thought ahead of the rules. And these focal points are very, very powerful and are very important. And I'm glad you also brought up the, the, the way it came from England. I was very much helped by uh, now Deidre McCloskey when he pointed out to me that in his view, Marx, Tani was misled by Marx, who didn't understand who was writing the complaints about enclosure. It was lords who didn't want to let their peasants free of them by giving them more control of their plots so they could do better on their own and not be dependent on the Lord. And one of the things I've realized when I look around the world that's different about rice farming and the need for the hydraulics is if you can grow in a remote area and control the road, you can really get cheap labor, whether it's rubber, cotton, several tr crops like that, where you really can, I, 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 I quick wrote down a list when you started, but rubber and, and, and cotton are, are two of the commodities that it doesn't take sophistication to tap the trees or plant the cotton. So you can have, if you can control an area where once people are in it, they can't get out or mining, you can have exploitation and then they can act as a group. We won't go to the mines today if they all live together, or we won't tap the trees till you give us our food again if they live together. So they're easier to organize simple demands in these groups when you can have everybody together and enforce it among others. There were norms among whaling ships when all the whaling ship captains lived in the same community on Nantucket Island in New England. And if a whale captain cheated on the, every kind of whale had different rules that Bob Ellison wrote about. But is it the first harpoon that gets the whale later? Is it the one who finds it and finishes it off? And it depended on the patterns of each kind of whale. And 
if a captain broke the norms, broke the rules that were agreed upon, nobody would help his wife out during the parts of the year when the captains were all at sea and nobody would play with their children. So there was an enforcement mechanism for something as, as different from what we're talking about as whales. Um, and I'm thrilled to get the reaction that the, the site to the Alistair Orr book, because when I was doing the work, the thing I was most scared about was right. I taught with Roger Ravel at Harvard at the beginning of all the changes in the world that the, um, global warming was was bringing about and had was in, was scared so much when I wrote the book that I would be wrong that the small motor that allowed women to get their rice you know uh, thrashed for them without taking them all day would not destroy Indonesia or the little motor that the peasants in Vietnam found were perfect for irrigating the field and getting another crop. We're not going to put people out of work, and it was tr nowhere in the world yet that the green revolution. It certainly changed the quality of the typical rice you eat in the world because the green revolution, four crops a year rice, is not nearly as fragrant and delicious as the yuppie rice you can still buy but it's feeding a hell of a lot more people who get a lot better meat and sauces to go with their rice today. And I'll, I'll stop there and thank you, Professor Austin. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. I, yeah, I know okay. everybody else is getting, it's the yeah, shortest okay. day of the year and I think Great. people are hungry. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pupkin. I, 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 I'll take a bit more of your time. And oh, you want. Yeah, yeah we're, we're not too hungry yet. And, uh, I just had breakfast, so I'm fine. Okay, so we are fine as well, I, I believe. Uh, I, I want to share with you very quick uh, uh, some very uh, short questions or, or comments. And uh, after that, uh, I said to open it to discussion with everyone, and that, that would give me a bit a, a time to deal with that. So the first thing that I had in mind is, well, I was hearing uh, your view about the uh, norms and so on, which I appreciate. I was thinking about, uh, of course, uh, Harding, the tragedy of the comments, and all these uh, aspects of a, a, a norms, whether people have them or not have them when they are a, operating together. And my question is, do you think that such norms are more enforceable or more existing in peasant societies or were more existing in peasant societies? Because I was thinking about your a, a, a lobster example, it's Kind of, it's not something that you you would see in everyday life, and I, and of course I can give an example from from my research, but I think it, it's it's less relevant. Now, something else that I want to ask you is about the process, the process of whether you think that there is process of changing norms within peasant societies. Um. Tomorrow we'll speak about it, you while we speak about it, I'll speak about it a bit, about uh, what we think that the Levantine societies were going through. And we believe that there is a kind of super households, big families, big organizations that were quite united and share norms and assisted each other, whatever. But then we see a process of change it really became to be more and more the operation of households, how you wrote about them and others wrote about them as well. So we have a kind of change in the size of the households. And we see also that there is change in, in, in share of people, like everyone has their own uh, capital, not sharing it so much and so on. And, and I, I wonder how you see that. 
And the third one is you mentioned the unity of people like in a revolt, the peasant revolt, or so on. But I would suggest to, to think about the logic of collective action here as well. Because when you go and deep investigate peasant revolts, and you did that, you would find that there are people, or there were people who fight, and there were people who stay at home and just waited to see the results. So for them, it was free riding on these particular a, a warrior. That's it. Oh, thank you very much. Um, the, if I could have one study done that I could read, it would be about the issue of the family. When I grew up, I had an enormous number of relatives. My, my mother had five siblings and her parents died when she was five. And so she was raised with an aunt and an uncle and a family with many children and people. So if I had everybody at my bar mitzvah, there'd be hundreds of cousins. And I get moving away, I've decided which ones are still my cousins and which ones used to be my cousins. And I've always wondered, you know, in China, you read everything about the importance of the clan. Well, I kept thinking, why is there no 10 million member family clan after thousands of years? Somewhere along the way, they hive off and they split. And when does it become a new clan or an old clan? And, and, and the work of um, the, the, two, the, the two economic historians who wrote about the changes in um, Jewish life after the year two, I'm blocking on the name and I love this book about the, the, the growth of literacy in, in Judaism and around the, the second century and how after the Arabs unified a large area, the poor literate farmers became wealthy urban traders around the world. And I'm, I can't believe I'm blocking on the name. Does anybody remember the name of the, this wonderful book on the first of three volumes of economic history of the Jewish people showing how the rise of trade had such a powerful impact on, on, on Jews after there was the rule around 200 AD that you have to teach the children to read and the, the number of Jews in the Roman Empire dropped drastically because a lot of people couldn't afford it. But ben, then you Benjamin just wrote the name. Yeah, it's, it's V. Eckerstein, the, the Chosen Few. Thank you. Thank you. It's, I, I, I was fascinated by that book. And if anybody knows any others like it, please send me an email so that I can, I can read them next. I found them it, it a fascinating explanation. And of course, then for hundreds of years, the literacy was only for one purpose, to read the Torah. And it worked as that alone, so that when the cities were a plausible way to move, you could move. And that's all about taking advantage of the options. And I think one option that seems to have mattered everywhere were roads or communications. And once you had open roads, people always took options. When, when Daniel Lerner wrote what was one of the most famous pieces of social science written in the post-war period, the passing of traditional society, 46 different countries published it as an example of how easy it's going to be to modernize when we get radio and television. Everybody will identify and support the national government. But in the book, the really big change is not that people have a radio and can listen to the speeches in Ankara. It was when the bus came to the village and all the men who honored the mullah and did work in the local fields found out they could, treat, they could get treated better and make more money if they took the bus into nearby Ankara. And then everybody complained about nobody wants to work. The, the landowners complained, everybody have gotten lazy. They don't want to work for us anymore. When what they really didn't want to do was be exploited quite as much when they could make more money working for somebody else. And th th this was part of the patterns of controlling an area and the elites play all sorts of their games to manipulate access to keep the peasants in control.
um, or to keep them in control of the peasants. I better make room for more questions. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot. Uh, everyone, yeah, whoever has question, comment, more than welcome just to start. Just a second, we'll open to everyone. Yeah, now everyone, whoever wants to speak, just click on your mic and you can start. You want to ask something? Yeah, Lamuel, uh, feel free. I had the uh, homework to about uh, about Adam's uh, peasant rationality, individuals, groups, and cultures. And also the main address was Schultz. Uh, it's interesting what is the, what's Popkin and, um, and others and maybe Austin re retaliation that he said that uh, the peasant can't be rational. Maybe sometimes, it's, and it depends how we uh, define rationality and the uh, collective action is um, against the individual. And maybe the, they know the, the, that's I'm having trouble and I'm, I'm having trouble with your sound. It's very, um, you're under, are you underwater? <laughs> I, I, I could not, I, I could not, I, I heard a gurgle without some of the words of, I, I heard rationality and, and, but I didn't get, I couldn't understand the question. I could I, not. I, I think, uh, I think that yes, the question is, time, is uh, Lamuel, can time, I? People complain. I want to ask what he uh, what he said about uh, what Adam said about peasant rationality, individual groups, and culture. Although the main address was Schultz, what he said. I still didn't okay. get all the words. Uh, I, I, Someone, I, I, I suggest we will uh, pick up more questions and maybe he can write he... it down as a chat. Yeah, Lamuel, can, do you want to write it down? Please. I'll try. Okay. So just write it and, and we'll get the, the next comment question. I see that uh, Joel wants to ask something. Joel, please. Hi, right, thank you. Um, well, I, my question is addressed uh, to whoever wants to answer it. But um, actually, to be honest, no, I, I, I strike that. I would like to ask uh, Professor Austin, Specifically regarding the the drive to protest, um, now I think that um, much of the literature that focuses on Europe, uh, well, it does tend to focus on economic realities. But often, when you apply it to the Middle East today, or North Africa, or various parts of the world, a lot of times we see violence as one of the striking features of of uprisings. Um, and, and I, I want to know, I guess, where violence as a, as a means of outburst, you know, in the hydraulic model, I, I suppose it's more, it makes more sense that violence sometimes just happens because people are angry and they want to take their anger out on other people. But um, in the rationality model, uh, what's the rationale uh, behind even sometimes extreme violence or even genocidal urges that sometimes take over the mob. Um, and and, we've, and we, we can't even say this is in the past. We see it even in our own present. Um, and so what can you speak to that? It's a very broad question. I'm not thinking of a specific example, although I do study Iraq and Lebanon and I see specific instances going on even in the news in recent days of a person being uh, assassinated and then their family and their friends start a riot because their, their friend was just killed and they don't even know who killed him, but they're upset about that. 
So how does that fit into the rationality model? Uh, okay, what, what I suggest is that, uh, Samuel, did you hear the question? Yeah, no, I heard that one very, very clearly. Okay, so, so, we, so you will answer the question of uh, Joel, and then Garrett would answer uh, the question of Lamuel. Oh, good. Let right. me just say, uh, Joel, there, there is a documentary about um, Lithuanian... Um, uprising during the Nazi occupation called the Partisans of Vilna. It was a national endowment for the humanities documentary. And I've never forgotten an interview with a woman who, when she was young, was one of the partisans who were ready to ambush the Nazis the next time they came into the, 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 the ghetto. And when the Nazis didn't come, they went off to be a band in the woods and survive the war. And it's an extraordinary story. But what she said, and I've never forgotten it is, if we were gonna die, we wanted to go out in a burst of glory. And that reminded me so much of the suicide bombers we see today. And it, it, I've never been able to forget that line. But the thing about the anger, there's an article by, two social psychologists members, one a member of the, the British Royal Academy in a book by Marie Fitzduff about Donald Trump. And there's an analysis of the Trump crowds and how the crowd creates an identity. And it's like an anthropological look at E.P. Thompson and how it works that you create an identity when you're part of a mob, you don't think about throwing the Molotov cocktail as going to punish you. It's we are doing this and you don't. It, and, and there is a way that there's a merger that goes on. And I don't understand it, but it's there. And it's a very important dynamic that we need to know more about, because if there's a huge difference in the world today, it's how easy it is to have individual violence in the days that you didn't have it. I mean, remember there was a period of centuries when you couldn't have a crossbow in England and that made it easy for the knights. And once the peasants got the crossbow, that was the end of the guy on the horse that could, that could be killed before he could ever dismount. Yeah, I, I may add that it also walks or can walk with the um, with the logic of collective action, if you add, you mentioned suicide bombing. So if you add to that aspects like what you expect to have in the world to come, or if you add to that aspects or, or, or questions about a, how to commit suicide in place that if you commit suicide, you go to hell. If you commit suicide bombing like with, with with the blessing and so on, you go to the other side. So I, it's not the answer, but I think that that we we have we have not to just to take it out all the, the the question of what the individual gets for that, rather to think about it also in aspect like this because they are related to revolt as well. And if you're yeah. a ruined woman because you've been raped, you might as well blow yourself up and get something out of it. Or, you know, or the fa if the family is going to be rewarded, you know, we might as well, you know, if, if you're going to send Esther off to sleep with the king for the good of everybody, or if Esther is going to be in the ham, in this case, we'll just let her go off and blow herself up and the family will be fine. So take one for the family. There's, I mean, it's yeah, not to be, I'm right. sure that's much too cynical. Yeah. And I yeah. apologize if, if, I just think of it as a general paradigm around the world, not about one specific place. Yeah. Hey, Garrett. Um, thank you. Um, okay, on Lemuel's question, um, it reminds me of a famous exchange in Indian economics back in the 60s, um, 60s to 70s, uh, with, I think, Ted Schultz, having written a paper 
um, arguing that um, surveys, both in the Philippines and in India, showed that peasants tried to uh, equate their marginal revenue and their marginal cost. And Michael Lipton had an article called The Myth of the Optimizing Peasant, in which he showed that for a, another village in India, inevitably there's a survey behind it, um, peasants, uh, if they did that, um, would die every third year. I'm making up the third year part, but the point is uh, it would only work as long as there wasn't a complete harvest failure, which was a possibility. But I think the, the point that, we, that the literature has absorbed since then is that, of course, rationality has to be understood in a broad sense. And the, the rational um, actor does try to take account of, for example, time. So that what might, uh, it, it isn't necessarily rational to try and equate your, to expand output to the point of which uh, one more unit of output costs the same as the revenue you'd get from it. Um, and for example, it doesn't, that what doesn't work if you're cocoa, a cocoa farmer. Um, when you come to planting decisions, um, planting something that will not produce, planting a tr cocoa tree is really an invest, creating an investment good, a capital good, that will begin to produce income some years in the future. So be, it would not be rational to base your decisions entirely on the current price. But if you, if you have the surplus to enable you to, to keep planting, then probably it might make sense. Um, so I think that would be my response, that one has obviously to be careful to avoid um, seeing it in very simplistic terms. But I, I do think the literature in various disciplines is um, uh, takes much more account of that than it did um, at the time of Lipton and others critiques. Um, I could just add, uh, um, going on, on Joel's question, um, I mean, I would see this to a considerable extent actually in uh, terms of the point that E.P. Thompson made, namely that when people were, uh, when you have English crowds or so-called mobs uh, protesting about the price of grain, or the price of bread, um, they were doing so, the trigger might be a rise in the price, but they were doing so because they felt that the authorities had violated a um, convention, which was that they would step in to safeguard the poor by various measures. Um, and that actually rings true, I don't say universally, um, I don't say you can't have a, if you like, a mindless um, action, but I think usually there is a mind mediating the incentives and the action that follows. And so one example would be cocoa farmers in colonial and post-colonial Ghana, what do they do when the price is held down artificially, whether by private monopolists in the 1930s or by state monopolists more recently, particularly in the 70s and 80s, early 80s. And one of the, what they did in Ghana in the colonial period was have a whole series of collective actions where they refused, hundreds of thousands of farmers refused to sell their cocoa beans to the European firms. But this wasn't simply about the price. They made it very clear and acted upon that, that they weren't going to be mollified by a simple return to the previous price. What they insisted upon was the breakup of the cartel that had fixed the price. But that only operated really for um, until the 1950s because it depended on certain political conditions. And you have to have an organization which enables you to respond. Um, it isn't simply a matter of the incentive and it isn't even simply a matter of the belief um, that I mentioned, but I think that is a large part of it. Very good. Great. Um, does anyone has any quick question? Or, yeah, or shall we uh, 
stop here.